Welcome everyone to an exciting webinar. Um, it's really uh, my pleasure to moderate, uh, you know, this webinar and introduce um, our speaker, Dr. Ivan Scott, who is an associate professor of biomedical engineering and microbiology and immunology within um, the McCormick School of Engineering and Feinberg School of Medicine here at Northwestern. Um, uh, Dr. Scott serves as co-director for the Therapeutic Design and Development Core for the Northwestern uh, O'Brien Kidney Research Core uh, Center. And um, you can see these um, uh, facts um, you know, about him and he's really a nanoparticle guru. And um, um, by, um, to um, help a little bit the transition to his presentation, I would like to ask him uh, to give us a brief overview. Can you know, Ivan, give us a brief overview of your research um, um, in uh, nanotechnology? Okay, uh, thank you so much for that uh, introduction. Next slide. Um, so. I find uh, this to be an extremely exciting time for, for nanomaterials um, and an extremely important time to try the nanomaterials in different areas, in particular the kidney. So I'm very excited about being able to apply some of the techniques we've developed in other areas uh, towards treatment of, of kidney disease. Um, and so I just wanna start by explaining quickly that, so I am essentially an immuno engineer. I've focused most of my time um, on developing materials and nanomaterials that can target immune cells. Um, and so we do a lot of very basic nanomaterials development, um, apply the nanomaterials that we develop towards immunology, try to understand how they interact with the immune system, and then combine those two things together, the material science and the immunology to develop targeted uh, immunotherapies. And so this is how we essentially uh, break down my lab uh, into these three different areas, uh, nanomaterials and nanobiomaterials development, uh, immunology, um, and then applying those towards immunotherapy. Um, so shown on the left here, are some of the different areas uh, that we work with um, in terms of application. We spend a lot of time in cardiovascular disease and other anti-inflammatory treatments, um, as well as cancer um, and infectious disease is a big area in our group. Um, we recently found that some of our targeting strategies could be applied to the treatment of eye disorders and glaucoma. Um, and so expanding from there, we decided to look into other areas. Um, and I was approached uh, to help with the Go Kidney Center. And we found this really exciting opportunity to start to apply some of these different techniques towards uh, targeting uh, of the kidney. So I will be very straightforward and blunt and that my background is not in nephrology or the kidney. Um, I am essentially um, new to this field for the last few years. I've been trying to learn as much as I can. Um, and I've been working quite a bit with really talented collaborators here at Northwestern, as well as with others um, that apply to the Go Kidney Center, the funding source, in order to apply some of our materials to um, your essentially unique um, uh, kidney models. So a few things we have in place right now that we're working on are kidney transplant tolerance, as well as targeting podocytes. Um, but we're also interested in working on any other area that you might have in mind. So I tried to frame this presentation to go over some of our capabilities um, with the hope that um, you could think about how you could apply some of these techniques towards your own studies. So first I wanna do a, a quick background on what are nanomaterials. I probably heard a lot about these recently due to the Moderna and Pfizer vaccine, uh, which you might've heard a lot of terminology being thrown around. So you'll hear nanomaterials, nanoparticles, uh, nanocarriers, nanodrugs, <laughs> nanobiomaterials. Um, they all have a very unique meaning uh, depending on the, um, the, the use. Uh, I like to use personally nanocarrier because we usually use these to carry and transport drugs or nanobiomaterial. And that's, I use biomaterial because there are many nanomaterials that are not designed to actually interact in biological systems. So these are specifically designed to interact um, in the body, um, interact with cells and proteins, for example. So showing here are some of the most commonly used nanomaterial types. You've probably heard of things like gold nanoparticles and quantum dots. Um, liposomes are quite commonly used uh, for many applications. They were the first clinically approved therapeutic in the form of doxo doxel, uh, which is the liposomal form of, of doxorubicin. And all these are going to fall within the size range of about viruses. Typically, um, nanoparticles range from 30 nanometers in diameter up to about 150 to 200 nanometers. You'll see some larger ones, but typically once you get up to about 500 nanometers, you start to call those, those microparticles. So these are going to be below, usually 300 nanometers in size, typically what we work with. 
Uh, and so this is why nanomaterials have really come to the forefront these days, which is these lipid nanoparticles that are being applied uh, to deliver the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Uh, and so this is a really great example of how a lot of engineering actually goes into this. So shown here is a structure for these lipid nanoparticles. Each one of these lipid components was, was selected to carry out a, a certain task in terms of how the particle functions. Uh, so we have these peg lipids that maintain a stability in the structure. We have charge groups here. This positive charge here maintains interactions with mRNA, which is negatively charged. Cholesterol controls the stiffness and fluidity of the membrane of the particles. So every single one of these parts was selected carefully to engineer a system that has a, a certain function. Um, so one thing I want to get the message across is that each nanoparticle is unique, has a unique function, and has a unique biodistribution within the body. Um, so many times people use nanomaterials as, as if it's a, a general thing. They all do the same thing. They're as distinct as, say, for example, a drug. Um, so each one has very unique properties and can be engineered to do something uh, very specific. Um, and so in this case, this was selectively engineered to interact with mRNA, which really cannot function um, in a vaccine form without some kind of protective carrier to help it get into cells as well as to stay stable. Uh, and so nanomaterials are actually quite common uh, throughout biology. They're, they're actually being generated in our bodies all the time and used for many different things. So that's not really like a far-fetched idea to use nanotechnology to take advantage of something that has actually evolved uh, within us. So tumors take advantage of exosomes to modify tissue um, their metastasis. Neurons use extracellular vesicles to communicate. Um, the most common nanoparticle in the body is probably going to be HDL and LDL to carry and transport lipids throughout our body. They are very highly uniform nanoparticulates, which are um, used by some people on campus. Uh, Shad Thaxon actually used synthetic HDL and HDL particles for his delivery systems. Um, and for us, the most important has been in the interaction between nanoparticles and immune cells for us. Um, so exosomes are used to communicate between immune cells. Uh, they can make their own exosomes to help with felicitate um, um, information across the, the immune system. Uh, so we've been trying to take advantage of this interaction, this evolved interaction between certain immune cell types and nanoparticles um, that allows us to communicate and modulate these cells. But these same principles can be applied to targeting and modulation of a, a wide range of different types of, of, cell, of cells. And so today I'd like to have everyone think about how this could be applied for, for kidney uh, targeting. Um, so these systems, these nanomaterial-based systems, by far have dominated uh, in cancer. Um, so the majority of this research has been focused towards targeting in cancer. Um, and the reason for that is pretty apparent is you're trying to deliver many times toxic agents to very specific locations in the body. Uh, and you can minimize, of course, the dosage if you can get more of the drug just to the tumor and not elsewhere where you're going to have side effects. And so nanomaterials are great for controlled delivery applications where you want to get to a certain cell while avoiding other organs and other locations uh, within the body. So they become instrumental and slow release systems for, for cancer. Um, and really important here is um, for loading of drugs. So this is an example of a particle that has a cargo, a payload inside. It's typically some kind of therapeutic that either needs protection or needs to be selectively targeted to a certain location, or many times the drug might not even be water soluble. Uh, and so the carrier functions to transport it throughout the body, something that usually just would not be able to even be solubilized um, um, in the bloodstream. Uh, and so shown here, just an example of this nanoparticle with different kinds of ligands on the surface like antibodies that can help with targeting this particle to certain locations in the body. So I'm gonna talk about why we design it this way um, and some things that aren't talked about enough in terms of how the structure of the particle makes a huge difference as well as the chemistry on the surface as well for targeting. So nanomaterials, are great um, for the things I just described, but there's still a lot of issues that we're trying to deal with. And so my lab focuses quite a bit on trying to address some of the limitations of nanomaterials to help them facilitate um, their use, um, actually in, in an actual clinical setting or for treatment. Uh, so a few things I wanna highlight that just should be uh, known and, and I just want to be straightforward. Um, there are still issues, of course, with targeting. Targeting is something that we want to do, that we're trying our best to do, but there's limitations. Um, and I'll explain those limitations uh, today. But typically for, you know, tumors have been the, to the, fo the focus of these targeting strategies for many years. We're still getting about 3% of the administered drug um, routinely to the target location. The rest is usually taken up in other locations, like the liver and the spleen. Um, and that's simply because the immune cells, the macrophages, the, the scavenger cells located in these locations, they're designed, they're engineered essentially through evolution to do this, to scavenge particulates that shouldn't be there. 
Um, and so they are going to take out the majority of, of the particulates, including nanomaterials. Um, so this is still an issue we're dealing with. And I'll give some strategies. I'll go over some strategies my lab is using today to, to, to get around that. Um, many times you'll have overly complex chemistry, so it's hard to scale up these to make them, them clinically relevant. Um, and still there's issues with loading. So sometimes it's difficult to load hydrophobic, I'm sorry, hydrophilic molecules like large proteins stably into particles. And when you try to load more than one type of payload, uh, you start to get into a lot of issues because many times nanoparticles are customized for one particular type of payload. You try to load a different one in there, it might not be ideal. So for example, trying to load something that's positively charged into um, a lipid nanoparticle designed to load negatively charged um, RNA and, and mRNA. So that's an example where you'd have some difficulty. So we've been trying to get around some of these issues. And when you do, you really start to see the advantage of nanomaterials, which is decreasing side effects, targeting specific cells, allowing more unique strategies uh, when you try to develop a therapy, um, lowering the dosage. Um, and many times you can actually repurpose or re-engineer how a drug functions. So I'll give one example today of how we re-engineer it, how a drug works simply by changing which cells are being targeted because many drugs have different functions or different effects and different cell types. So if you control which cells are targeted, you can actually control or change the therapeutic effect. Um, and one really unique thing about nanoparticles is that we can trace where they go. So this area called theranostics is therapeutics and diagnostics together. So we can actually say fluorescently tag or have some kind of diagnostic agent inside the particle so we can actually see where the drugs are going and what cells are being modified. And this really helps with optimization um, as well as trying to figure out what went wrong. For example, sometimes if you don't see the result that you're looking for. Uh, and so in the area of kidney disease, um, all these different benefits can be applied to the kidney. Uh, particular things that stand out to me would be the cell specific uh, targeting. Uh, there are many different cell types within the kidney like podocytes and endothelium that could be a benefit for therapeutically. Uh, we can customize and engineer the surface chemistry and structure for selective passage or avoidance of the urinary space. Um, we can make them bioresponsive. They can respond to certain like pH changes or different um, molecules present or enzymes present in certain locations. Um, and one thing that's come out in some of the research that we're working on is that in the disease state, when you have a leaky um, endothelium or epithelium, you can actually take advantage of this to enhance the delivery of, of nanoparticles. Uh, so we're seeing some abnormal glomerular filtration that can occur, and this actually can be beneficial for getting nanoparticles and targeted particles to cells of interest like, like podocytes. Um, so this is just, a, that's the basic intro to nanomaterials. I wanna go over some of the materials that we work with that we would allow um, you to work with if you were to collaborate through the Kidney Center. Um, these are some of the, the structures that we would be able to uh, load your drugs into or, or use to facilitate your, your therapeutic strategies. So we work with uh, self-assembled materials. So these are materials that are composed of amphiphiles. So they have one side that's water soluble um, and one side that's hydrophobic, water insoluble. And so the best example for this um, are, are lipids, uh, for example, uh, phospholipids uh, is an example shown here, where this polar head group will orient toward an aqueous environment and the lipid tail will aggregate together. And when this happens, you can actually organize these molecules into very unique structures. And this is just an example here for making those lipid nanoparticles loaded with mRNA. You just essentially throw everything together um, and this will orient itself on its own based on thermodynamics um, to form a controlled uniform particle. And so this makes it very useful for making uniform particles quickly. Um, it also can allow you to customize the structure and the interactions that happen here, depending on what kind of amplifiers that you use. Uh, and so to better control this, we don't use lipids. We actually use synthetic polymers. Um, so these polymers allow us to really engineer the properties in order to control that self-assembly. Um, and the, the big point here is that we can control the size and essentially the volumetric ratio of the hydrophilic side and the hydrophobic side. And when you change that volumetric ratio, you change the curvature. And that allows us to actually specify what kind of shape that we're actually going to get. And I'll talk quite a bit today about how this shape, not just the chemistry, but the shape actually matters quite a bit in terms of targeting different locations, including uh, the kidney. So we can very precisely make these polymers and very precisely assemble them into these different types of, of structures. The most common um, hydrophilic group that we use is called PEG polyethylene glycol, uh, which is very commonly used across biology and medicine. Um, I just want to point out that we can shift that, we can change that to something else. 
Um, I can talk about that later if you're interested, but there are issues in terms of making antibodies against PEG because we're so exposed to PEG throughout our life. Um, so we have ways of switching out the PEG with different types of molecules. This is an example here, um, a different hydrophilic branch that we could use. Um, in terms of the hydrophobic side, the lipid tail component, uh, we use this really hydrophobic um, polymer called polypropylene sulfide. And this is as shown here. Um, so we have the PEG side and we have the polypropylene sulfide side. Um, we use PPS um, for the fact that it's very hydrophobic, but you know, there are many different hydrophobic things, there are lipids and other polymers, but we also like the fact that it's sensitive to oxidation. Um, so this actually allows it to have, for example, a, an exit route. Um, so once it's done its job, it can be cleared very easily because this hydrophobic side becomes hydrophilic when it oxidizes. And this will oxidize very slowly in the body or very rapidly within certain cells. In particular, immune cells will degrade these rapidly. Um, certain endothelial cells will take these particles in and rapidly oxidize them as well. And this allows very quick payload release with inside of a certain target location while the particles can remain stable in the extracellular environment. Um, and we can also trigger this using lights and all kinds of other mechanisms. So we like this oxidation sensitivity. And that's one of the main reasons we stick with the PPS group. So yeah, most of our systems are PEG and PPS. Um, and we control them to self-assemble into these different types of structures. I've shown some examples here. Uh, we have these elongated filaments. Uh, we have these small particulates called, called mysoles, which are probably the most commonly used nanoparticle that are being published. Um, and we have vesicles. These are very similar to liposomes. We call them polymerosomes, except they're, they're vesicles form of polymers instead of lipids. Um, so these are used by other labs as well. Um, our lab uniquely uses these two structures on the bottom right here. I'll talk a bit about these more in detail later. Um, but these bicontinuous nanospheres have very unique structures uh, and stability that we take advantage of for drug delivery. Uh, in these nanogels here, we develop to be able to load um, many different drugs at the same time. So it is, it's designed for multi-drug loading to address one of those issues I, I discussed um, in the past that still presents issues for, for making nanoparticles. So here's some of the advantages of our system. Um, they, it is scalable. So shown up here is uh, a technique called flash nanoprecipitation. It's a microfluidic based mixing process where we can actually control the self-assembly to make these particles in very large scales. And so that allowed us to do studies like in higher order animals, uh, mammals like primates. We've done primate studies for heart disease um, and for targeting just to verify that our targeting strategies work both in mouse, mice as well as in primate models. Um, the loading efficiency for our nanogel system is extremely high for all kinds of molecules. Um, so essentially we can get almost 100% efficiency for loading, which is very rare, uh, particularly for loading proteins um, and nucleic acids. Um, but this is something that's an advantage of, of our system. Uh, the targeting also is very nice with this system. We can customize the targeting of, of organs. Uh, so we can enhance targeting of the kidney, avoid the kidney. Um, we can target spleen, avoid the spleen, um, as well as target specific cell types. We, again, we've mostly focused on targeting specific immune cell types. But we've also shifted no, now towards targeting different types of endothelium, which I'll give one example where we target um, endothelium in the eye, um, which can be applied, of course, to the kidney and, and other organ systems. Um, there's also enhanced... Well, they had a video here. I'm not sure why it's not playing, um, but um, this was showing enhanced intracellular delivery into cells. Um, so one really important thing is once the particle gets delivered in the body, does it actually get into the cell of interest and does it deliver, deliver its payload, its therapeutic, to the location where it's going to be active? And many times drugs, of course, are going to be active inside of cells. And so can you get the drug into the cell um, very rapidly and very efficiently? And so these systems are designed for uptake by cells as well as release of the payload inside of the, the, the cellular uh, internal environment. Uh, we also can enhance the system in terms of avoiding side effects, um, as well as uh, really importantly, we don't have any background immunostimulation by these, po by these polymers. So many polymer systems, they'll have some kind of a background inflammatory response, which can um, add on to or impact your therapeutic treatment. Um, this comes up a little bit with Particles that are commonly used like PLJ particles has a, has a background of anti-inflammatory effect, um, which sometimes is good, but sometimes it isn't. Um, and the best example are viral vectors. So if you're delivering your payload with, with a virus, the virus typically will have some kind of a strong inflammatory response because it's essentially it's a virus. It's made of components that are known to trigger uh, immune responses. So that's one advantage of this PEG PPS system is it has a very, very low background immunostimulation, makes it very customizable for targeting cells and delivering different kinds of payloads. 
So I want to quickly go into some of the different types of structures that we work with that has some unique properties um, that you could take advantage of if you wanted to work uh, through the Go Kidney Center. Um, the bicontinuous nanosphere is the first one because it's a good example of showing how the structure matters. So the unique cubic structure, it has this internal um, structure of cubic lattice. Um, it's actually like porous channels going through a solid hydrophobic core is the best way to describe it. Um, so it has this hydrophobic PPS exterior and has these aqueous channels that go throughout it. And so we can trap large proteins, all kinds of things inside of these and control the release rate. But really importantly is that this structure is highly stable. So many of the particles will go into cells and they'll break apart immediately, which sometimes we want that. But these particles are actually designed to stably retain their payload and can slowly release them inside of cells. So this has actually been something we're investigating for cancer as well as for cellular therapy, where say you can ex vivo modify a cell, inject that that cell and the drug that's inside, inside these particles will slowly modify that cell as it carries out its function, as it's being um, carrying out its function inside the body. So it's a good way of modifying cells for longer periods of time or releasing payloads slowly inside of cells. And so we've shown release for almost up to a week uh, inside of cells and culture going back and forth, uh, being exocytose, endocytose, and the particles remain stable and slowly release their payloads inside of the cell endosome. Uh, this example shown here was delivering a, a chemotherapeutic, so a toxic payload. And so inside of these uh, these particles, the payload was not releasing inside the cells until it was triggered. So even though this chemotherapeutic would kill the cell typically, it was actually stable for days inside of these cells until we triggered the release with light. And so we can trigger these kinds of releases with light, with mRNA, with all kinds of different external stimuli to control when the payload releases into the cells. And this is just one example in terms of cancer therapy. You only want it to release in the tumor um, so you can prevent a lot of side effects by inhibiting release inside of other cells. Um, something else that was important for us, it was controlling the release rates of nanoparticles. So typically nanoparticles are injected through bolus injection. So you IV inject them typically over and over and over. You do a sub Q injection in the case of a vaccine. Um, you cannot take nanoparticles like these orally because they will be broken down um, in the stomach. Um, and so we looked into this, how can we actually have sustained release of nanomaterials in their nanoparticle form in the body? And that's where we went into biomimicry. So as I mentioned, our body makes nanomaterials all the time. Uh, viruses, for example, are blebbing from the surfaces of cells. And so we wonder, can we actually mimic this in a synthetic system? So we designed this hydrogel system shown here that is made of filaments. So these high aspect ratio filaments, they can be loaded with drugs and in the controlled fashion, they will switch to a different structure that delivers the drug. So it will switch from a filament to a micelle to release the payload um, in a micelle form. So this is slowly releasing micellar nanoparticles um, from a cross-linked filament hydrogel. And so we can load drugs inside the filament. We inject these and they'll form a gel right there in the site of injection. So these are injectable gels. This is what the gel looks like after it solidifies inside of a mouse model. And over time, it will slowly break down um, into these micellar vehicles. And so these micelles will carry the payload that's trapped in the gel and deliver them just like a, if you had a bolus injection over and over and over, this is just slowly releasing the payload in the form of these nanoparticles. Um, and so this is a, we feel it's like a third type of degradation of nanoparticle of, of hydrogels. Um, so you can have a hydrogel breakdown from erosion at its surface at the molecular level. You can have bulk degradation where pieces and chunks break off. In this case, we're only degrading based off of these uniform um, micellar particles. And so um, this is something unique to our lab. So this is something we could take advantage of for a slow release system um, if you wanted to have a chronic or modify a chronic um, in, uh, state. This is just an example of that system further showing we can load many different types of fluorophores and drugs uh, inside. It'll form the gel in situ and we can have release for months uh, inside of mouse models. Uh, we studied this quite a bit, um, looking at how long we've got up to about two to three months of release. Um, over time, it'll still be releasing and modifying the cells of interest. In this case, we're modifying immune cells, but you could modify another cell type, um, of course, over long periods of time. Um, and the, importantly, the drug, this is a model fluorophore as the drug, and this is looking at the fluorescence of the polymer. The ratio of the drug to the polymer stays the same, whether it's in the hydrogel or in the released micelle form. That means that it's releasing the payload uh, in the micelle form in a controlled fashion. The concentration of the drug in that micelle is, is being controlled and is releasing at the same as the initial 
concentrations inside the filament. So that just means that we have control over the amount of drug that's being released. Uh, so far, last year, we published showing that we could actually um, deliver anti-inflammatory molecules in a sustained fashion. Uh, we use this to release anti-inflammatory vitamin D3, uh, activated vitamin D loaded nanoparticles, uh, which actually was able to maintain high levels of regulatory T cells uh, within a mouse model of atherosclerosis for, for months at a time. So one injection, you have your, your Treg levels optimized or, or activated and heightened for therapeutic treatment for a long period of time from a single, single injection. The other system I wanted to briefly go over is the one where we just developed to load many different drugs at the same time. I'm not gonna bore you too much with uh, the chemical details, um, but it uses a unique mechanism um, of forming sulfur, sulfone zippers. Um, so this is actually not a block of polymer. It's just the oxidized form of PPS. It turns out that in certain solvents, uh, it will zipper together, kind of like DNA. It'll zipper together to form these larger structures, which we can use uh, to form controlled nanoparticles. And so we did a lot of modeling, which I won't get into with our collaborator, Monica de la Cruz, to figure out how all this works. Um, but essentially, um, we can very easily make these particles um, high volumes, load things very easily inside of them, um, lar make large amounts and control the structure. So we can make the filaments, we can make the vesicles, we can make the micelles, um, gram scale very quickly. They actually form in a matter of minutes um, and you can load really almost anything into these particles. And so we just received a grant that just started in July to study this in more detail. Um, so if anyone is of interest uh, looking for multi-payload delivery, uh, this would be the system that we would recommend. Um, this is, I don't wanna go into too much detail again, but this is just how it works. Um, it forms a network throughout the solution. So it will form a gel in solution, but we can control um, the environment to cause it to collapse. So by, by changing the polarity of the solvent, it will collapse into nanoparticles. And when this gel or this network collapses on itself, it actually collects everything that's inside the solution around it. And so when it does that, it will trap any kind of protein, any small molecule, anything in the solution. This is an example of dextran. Um, this is looking at a FRET signal showing that it's being compressed uh, into these particles. So you get a FRET signal only when the particles actually form. Um, showing that we are compacting and forming these, these compact nanoparticles. Um, and so this is very good, not just for loading of drugs and various molecules, but for water purification um, as well. We're looking into that. Um, the, the grant that we have recently funded is looking at rapid vaccine design with these because these particles release their payloads into cells. Um, so if you want to target podocytes and endothelium, they will release inside the cell. But we can really customize the loading of different molecules inside of the same particle. So here we have an example for a vaccine. You have a protein, you have a nucleic acid, you have a lipid, and you have a small molecule payload. And we're controlling the levels of each one of these, um, each one achieving about 95 to 100% loading efficiency. Um, and all of them are bioactive. Um, and this is just an example of us customizing a vaccine platform where we can optimize antibody responses by combining different levels of these different adjuvants together. So it's completely biocompatible in, in mice. Um, no issues there with toxicity. Um, but if you have a system where you want to load multiple drugs, maybe you want to have a floor four in there as well, um, this would be the system that we would uh, recommend. So I'm going to stop there. Um, this is at the, the 20 minute halfway point, uh, just to see if anyone has any questions about just nanomaterials in general or our nanomaterial systems before I start getting into the details of how we uh, enhance the targeting and use them for various applications. Um, that sounds uh, great, Ivan. And uh, since we don't have right now questions in the Q&A and that chat, I'm going to limit up to one question, um, you know, from me. Um, how about um, uh, microenvironmental factors uh, relevant to kidney disease? Uh, so in the kidney, uh, there are alterations in oxygen gradients, hypoxia, um, reactive oxygen species, um, areas with acidosis. Mm -hmm. uh, can someone actually use nanocarriers to target uh, specific areas in the kidneys um, to try to uh, um, as, uh, take advantage of these changes? Yes. And so this is one place where you can take advantage of all the work that's been done in the tumor microenvironment. Uh, so of course, the tumor also has different kinds of changes in pH, enzymes are present, all kinds of things, even temperature can change. Um, so that's also one reason why we use polymer systems. 
Um, so we can really customize these polymers to be sensitive to pH. They can be sensitive to enzymes. They can be sensitive to temperature. Um, they can be sensitive to um, reactive oxygen species. That's actually one of the main reasons that we use the PPS system is the oxidation sensitivity. Um, so that's how we can actually further enhance the targeting is that these payloads, you know, even if they go to the off-target locations, you can have some kind of say enzymatic or pH or location specific sensor um, or mechanism of causing localized release. So, so yes, that's a very good question. And that is something that is definitely customizable um, for targeting locations in the kidney. Um, great. And logistically, uh, so since these uh, systems have been already tested to some degree in cancer models, what is the timeline um, from mm -hmm. your experience that, you know, someone needs to, to spend to characterize the um, efficiency, the efficacy of these uh, systems in the kidney? Uh, so that depends on your resources. Um, and so everyone here at Northwestern is actually quite lucky because um, Material science and nanomaterial science here at Northwestern is probably one of the strongest in the country. Um, so we have all kinds of equipment here, mostly on the Evanston campus uh, for materials characterization, uh, for animal model modification and checking to see like where they release. We have very nice IVIS systems, a lot of flow. Um, we can very quickly customize nanoparticle systems for various applications and test to see where they're going. Um, so in some places this could take years to develop um, because of the resources here at Northwestern and our strong focus on material science and, and nano delivery, um, I, I'd say like months, uh, we can get a lot of things done very quickly. That's excellent. Well, you know, it's a wonderful resource for the kidney community. So, um, well, I will pause here and let you to continue with your presentation. Okay, uh, thank you for the question. So this next section, I want to talk about how we actually um, target. How do we get to the certain location that we want? Because this is one of the, you know, the key advantages uh, of nano delivery. Um, and so for us, one of the big advantages is biomimicry. Uh, we see this interaction that happens between natural nanoparticles, and particularly with viruses in immune cells. And so we try to engineer the size, the shape, the surface chemistry, and the charge of our particles to match something that actually already works, so has actually evolved already in biological systems. So we mimic viruses quite a bit in terms of their all their functions and their properties, even how they display ligands on their surface. We control how that's displayed on our particles um, in order to interact with receptors. And, and I'll talk a little bit about how we can optimize uh, those kinds of properties for selective targeting of different uh, cell types. This is how we can actually characterize our materials. Um, again, like I just mentioned, these particle systems that actually are quite difficult to find in other locations. We have Argonne National Lab, which actually is pretty critical for characterizing certain types of shapes of particles using X-ray scattering. Um, but this is an example here where you can actually see particles. This is called nanosite. Um, it's a fairly, it's a newer type of technology where you can actually see nanoparticles um, and see how they move around. And we can use their, their motion, their diffusion rates in solution to calculate their size. Um, electron microscopy is a big way of looking at, is a major way of looking at these particles as well. Um, we have some really unique people here on campus like Nathan Gianeschi as well, who can actually take movies at the nanoscale. So you can actually have movies to see interactions with cells and, um, and how the particles move around, um, which is also something that's quite uh, unique and advantage here at Northwestern. Um, and so we're trying to engineer these, the targeting to interact with very specific receptors on cells. And as I mentioned, we've mostly focused on immune cells. Um, and the main immune cell type of interest for us was the, is the dendritic cell. Um, this of course does have function, of course, in terms of inflammation systemically. So this would have impact in the kidney, but also with macrophages, targeting macrophages and monocyte populations, very similar strategies for modification of those cells as well. Uh, but essentially you have your nanoparticulate loaded with payloads that are taken into the cell. So you can imagine this could be an endothelial cell as well, um, how we're modifying it. These particles get processed inside of endosomal compartments and whatever payload you have will affect the function of the cell. So in the case of a vaccine, we have adjuvants in there. This will cause receptor expression, co-receptor expression on the surface of the cell, as well as them to release like specific types of cytokines. Uh, and so for pro-inflammatory, like in vaccines and cancer immunotherapy, we're activating effector T cells. Uh, for other systems where we want a tolerogenic or anti-inflammatory system, we deliver an anti-inflammatory molecule. And vitamin D was one example I mentioned before that actually inhibits expression of certain uh, stimulatory molecules and causes different types of cytokines to be expressed by these cell types. Uh, and that activates regulatory T cells. 
And so that's one reason why we can work in so many different areas is because by targeting just a few immune cell types, we can actually go the telogenic route or we can go a pro-inflammatory route. Um, and so we can also imagine decreasing inflammation in the kidney or targeting um, cancer, localized, localizing the kidney as well. These same principles will, will apply there also for targeting different cell types within the kidney. Um, so, so I want to go into a little bit more detail about how nanoparticles have been studied actually in terms of targeting within the kidney. There actually has been quite a bit of work done um, in this area. Um, just for some reason, there just aren't that many people um, still in this space. Um, so this is a really nice uh, review paper um, that was published, I think, 20, yes, 2016. Uh, so this really goes over some of the, the characteristics of the glomerular endothelial cell endothelium here that actually influences how particles can actually pass through. So of course, this is a um, highly negatively charged interface here that has uh, glycoproteins present, has a glycocalyx shown uh, right here. That means that positively charged particles actually pass through much easier due to interactions with the negatively charged interface here. Uh, there's also a size limitation. So the gaps between the endothelial cells um, that are here will influence the size of the particle that can go through. Uh, so particles between four to 11 nanometers typically are able to pass um, into, um, uh, pass through the glomerular endothelial cell membrane shown here, the basement membrane, and can interact with cells of interest. Many times, the, uh, most of the time, the cell of interest is going to be podocytes and cells on the other side here. So being able to pass through this interface is really critical. And so there's a size dependence, there's a charge dependence, and recently it's been found there's also a structure dependence. So if you have a large but filamentous like rod-shaped particle, if it has a a high aspect ratio and like a, a narrow diameter, but very long, it can actually pass through at larger sizes. Um, so this is also something that we can customize. We can customize the shape, the charge, um, and the structure of the particles to enhance being able to permeabilize and enter um, into uh, the space. Um, and so importantly, in disease, these things can change. Um, you can have less dependence on charge. And really importantly, um, you can have increases in size of the gaps. And so this is one area we've made some progress with our collaborators is showing that only in disease state can the nanoparticles actually pass through. Um, and so this can actually be beneficial. Um, but the main thing is that we can have larger particles now entering into the space to target cells of interest um, for treatment um, because of the leakiness that can occur at this interface. So there's been quite a bit of work done uh, in terms of looking at what size particles get through. Um, this is just showing here with quantum dots showing that there's a cutoff around five nanometers, at least for this particle type at this charge state uh, for getting through. Um, but there is a really important combination. So the, set, the size, shape, and the charge all matter. Um, and so for different charges, there's actually a different size limitation. Um, and this is just shown here that if you have a positively charged particle, it can be larger to get through. And that's because of the interactions here at the negatively charged interface. If it's a negatively charged particle, it typically has to be smaller in order to pass through. But this all kind of depends on the disease model um, and the damage at the endothelium that's, that's present. So how does this targeting actually work um, in terms of design of the particles uh, chemically? And so this was actually the first thing that was done when people design nanomaterials is figure out how we can enhance really the circulation time. Uh, this is the, the example of the first nanoparticle type that was clinically approved, which is doxorubicin loaded inside of liposomes or doxel. It actually went through about 17 years of optimization. Uh, they had to go back to the drawing board because the first iteration was actually cleared just immediately. As soon as it was injected, those scavenger cells, just they just took them up and they were gone. Never had a chance to get to the tumor. Um, so they put a hydrophilic polymer chain on the surface. In this case, it was PEG, which is stuck around to this day. PEG is the most common one that minimizes those nonspecific interactions. And so what it was actually doing was minimizing interactions, what's called the mononuclear phagocyte system. This is that system of scavenger cells that go around just taking up things that shouldn't be there. Um, and so by enhancing the ability of these particles to circulate, this PEG corona enhanced the circulation time by up to two days, it allowed the particle to circulate long enough to get to the tumor. And that was a key finding that has to this day been a key part of nano design and delivery. To add upon this, you can actually put targeting ligands in here too. So for example, you can put a peptide or an antibody. So you have inhibition of interactions that you don't want while promoting the receptor interactions that you do want by putting an antibody or something else on the surface there to, to promote these membrane interactions to promote cell uptake. 
So this is one of the key things we work on. How do we avoid this MPS system, which is everywhere? It's located in the skin and the, primarily in the liver and the spleen. They're going to clear the majority, but also the lung, other locations are going to, the lymph nodes are all going to be taking up these particles um, indiscriminately, unless you have some kind of mechanism in place to control the targeting. Uh, and so some people have done quite a bit of work on looking at how you can target with inside of the, of the kidney. Uh, I, I say, in my opinion, the best work has been done by Yunji Chung, who is um, actually an assistant professor at USC. Uh, she's done some really nice work showing how you can target specific types of cells within the kidney. And she's made some really, so published some really nice review articles that kind of outline the different kinds of targeting moieties that you can use to target specific cell types. And so for example, in our studies right now, we're looking at the podocytes, we're looking at using cyclic RGD to target integrants, alpha five, beta three integrants that are expressed by, by podocytes. But there are different, many different types of targeting molecules you can use. Uh, this is just some of the examples here small molecules, proteins, peptides, aptamers, which are of course DNA, uh, which are oriented uh, with certain sequences to have a confirmation that can interact with receptors of uh, specific receptors. Antibodies, of course, are very commonly used. They're large, it makes it more difficult to work with. So we prefer using peptides, but antibodies are fine as well. You can control their display on the surface. Um, and she's shown some really nice work demonstrating how you can enhance targeting in the kidney um, and minimize targeting other locations. Of course, targeting certain places still is an issue. We still have sometimes these off-target effects like in the liver, but we're definitely getting better at this. This is just an active area in nan nanomedicine, decreasing this liver targeting. So how are, are we doing this? We're doing all of these. Um, so for example, we're doing um, active targeting. That is the most commonly fo common form of targeting where you have that ligand on the surface. Uh, one of these one of these different types of ligands um, on the surface of the particle. Uh, we do an in vitro optimization step where we optimize the display density, just like on the a surface of a virus, how it has an optimal spacing and density of its target ligand, uh, targeting ligands on its surface. Um, it matches very nicely, the, it can match very nicely the expression level of the target receptor on a cell. So we do a lot of in vitro optimization first to enhance the targeting um, of cells. And that's important because you know you have a target but there are other cells many times that express the same ligand and that's where those side effects occur. So if you can optimize not just on the specificity for ligand, but also the expression level of the ligand, you can have uh, more specificity. Uh, we can combine that with other things like passive targeting where you change the shape because the shape is important for uptake by different cells as well as the biodistribution. Um, and we have some unique things that uh, we just published where we're really the only ones that have uh, worked in, the, in these areas where we try to combine some of these different strategies in unique ways. Um, so shown here um, is a big issue that happens as it's, it's mainly talked about in the biomaterial space, but and not so much in other areas, but anything that you put into contact with blood, particularly at the nanoscale or larger, will have protein stick. So this is an absorption process where proteins just bind to the surface and they denature. And this is actually one of the early forms of an immune response is denatured proteins will interact with scavenger cells or scavenger receptors on cells. And that controls how they're taken up and cleared by the body. Um, so we actually decided, to, can we control how proteins bind and denature in order to specify the cell types that interact with those adsorbed proteins? And so it actually turns out that is something that we can actually use to enhance um, by specifying that surface chemistry on top of the shape on top of the targeting moiety to minimize or promote certain types of receptor interactions. And finally, this newest thing that I'll talk about briefly in the next slide is indirect targeting. Um, this is something that we really want to use to get around that liver targeting. Um, so that liver uptake and clearance, how do you avoid that? Um, so it, the liver doesn't care. Those, those those MPS cells, they don't care if you have a targeting ligand on the surface, they indiscriminately undergo macropenocytosis and just sample fluid around them and scavenge. Um, and so how do you avoid that? So we decided to try a kind of a unique idea. I didn't think it was gonna work, but it actually worked out quite well. Um, we're calling it indirect targeting because we're enhancing the targeting indirectly by inhibiting uptake elsewhere. So it's a two-step process where we have a nanoparticle that inhibits macropenocytosis being injected first um, followed by a particle that is going to be therapeutic, that goes where you want it to go. Uh, so by inhibiting the particle first, you minimize uptake in off-target locations like the spleen. So this is an example of where the particle goes if it has no inhibition, it gets taken up by the spleen. So we just take advantage of that. We inhibit the spleen, um, um, MPS cells, and then we follow it up with our particle of interest. And now you have nice circulation time um, and the ability to target cells of interest elsewhere because you don't have them being taken up in the spleen or the liver. Um, so this is how that system works. Um, this is 
a, we call it a macroprenestatosis inhibitory particle. It actually has LAT A, latrunculin A as the active agent. Uh, this inhibits macroprenestatosis, but it does it in our particles in a non-toxic way. So this just shows that we can inhibit macroprenestatosis. Uh, so dextran is dependent on that process while not inhibiting receptor mediated uptake. So this shows here, transferrin receptor uptake. Uh, we're not inhibiting that with our particles. Um, and so that means that we can have this dual system uh, where we inject our inhibitory particles first. They travel to the spleen, the liver, stop uptake. And then we follow up with our, we call it the effector particle. That's the particle of interest. And now that particle can be free to circulate, just like with original with doxorubicin, uh, with doxel. Being able to circulate longer allows better uptake in the target location. And so with this, I'll just running out of time, so I'll quickly go through this. We can actually enhance targeting within tumors by up to about eight fold. Um, so there's no reason why we couldn't do this as well for targeting uh, within the kidney um, also. So this targeting um, process worked in other areas. Um, I'm gonna skip through this because this is for the eye, just an example of active targeting. We can design receptor constructs, uh, peptide constructs to target specific receptors. We optimize these quite a bit. This is targeting a very rare cell population within the eye, the slums canal, showing uptake selectively there while avoiding uptake in other locations. And so these kinds of systems can, this is um, the use for decreasing um, pressure in the eye. But these kinds of systems can be used for targeting uh, many different locations, for example, in the kidney. Um, as I mentioned before, passive targeting uh, is due to the shape of the particle. And so shown here, we're comparing different shapes and are uptake in different locations. Uh, and we see here, there are certain particles that have preference for being taken up in the kidney. Uh, one here, the mysel was taken up better, um, particularly just in the liver uh, in the, and in the kidney. So this is very similar to uh, Yun Ji's work with the targeting ligands, except this is just with the shape. So we're having specificity for the liver and the kidney just by changing the shape of the particle without any kind of receptor targeting moiety on the surface. Now, if you combine that with receptor targeting, you get even better um, enhancement. So that's what we focus on quite a bit is taking these different shapes um, that have already some predisposition for uptake in the kidney or other locations and then adding um, targeting specificity to it. Um, and combining that with you know, changing the surface chemistry. This is just showing how it works in terms of controlling adsorption of proteins. Proteins come down and stick to the surface of the particle, um, causing them to change and denature. And that re results in denatured protein interacting with these scavenger receptors. And I'm gonna skip through this quickly, but we change different chemistries in order to interact with these different receptors on the cells. And very interestingly, we found certain locations, certain chemistries are good at targeting the kidney. Some avoided the kidney. Um, some were targeting in the, in the lung and some avoided the lung. And so this is just another layer that we can add on to our targeting, uh, which is the actual surface chemistry of the particle to specify what turned out to be the conformation of protein. So we developed a bunch of assays to look at what, how did the conformation of proteins change, their enzymatic susceptibility, their structure. This is circular dichroism. Look at the secondary structure of proteins. And we isolated it as being albumin. Um, the most common protein in blood was actually denaturing on the surface of the particles and resulting in interactions with selectively one type of scavenger receptor, SRA1. Um, so we could control the structure of albumin on the surface of the particle to evade or promote interactions with um, macrophage scavenger receptors. And this also does have implications, as we showed in the previous slide, for targeting um, in the kidney. We had some a recent study. This was, these were both published this year, but our most recent publication shows that this combines with the shape. Again, if you have a certain shape and a certain surface chemistry, the uptake by cells differs. So shown here is um, a certain chemistry and surface, um, surface chemistry and structure that promotes dendritic cell targeting, um, but it can inhibit or, or avoid dendritic cell uptake in other locations just by changing the shape of the particle, um, combining that with the surface chemistry. So this just gives us dis different control, different layers um, of targeting. Um, and so one of our best examples was for anti-inflammatory treatment, where we combined um, this active targeting with the ligand with passive targeting of the shape to really specify the targeting of a selective cell type with inside of um, atheromas. So these atheromas are full of macrophages, but they're also full of dendritic cells at a lower level. So we wanted a system that could selectively target dendritic cells to get anti-inflammatory signals to dendritic cells um, in order to promote anti-inflammatory treatment for, for heart disease. And so this is the system. And I'm showing this because this just shows how we can optimize and design a system or customize a system, say for you, if you're interested in working with the kidney center. So we select the structure. In this case, a vesicle structure is better at targeting dendritic cells. It has a preference for uptake by dendritic cells. 
Um, it also had a preference for targeting in the spleen, uh, which is where we wanted to get some of these anti-inflammatory modifications of regulatory T cells from modifying um, dendritic cells in the spleen. Uh, so the shape was selected. We also designed a custom targeting ligand shown here, a lipid tail with our targeting peptide. We customized that, we optimized the display on the surface, and we loaded inside a therapeutic molecule, in this case, anti-inflammatory vitamin D. So we combined all these things together to form this type of optimized system, uh, which we further tested in vitro to selectively have decreased uptake by macrophages and enhanced uptake by dendritic cells. Uh, this worked very well in vitro. Uh, we found this sweet spot here. This is just the chemistry for that. I won't go into detail, but the chemistry for the targeting ligand was optimized for enhanced targeting of dendritic cells, um, for very nice intracellular delivery, um, and this carried over in vivo. So in vivo, with our optimized system, we only saw enhanced uptake for dendritic cells. Uh, and this, of course, can carry over for other cell types. We didn't see enhanced uptake for those macrophages in the background. Uh, and this carried over very nicely therapeutically with decreased um, atheroma development, decreased inflammatory cell accumulation, decreased lipids uh, with inside the vessel uh, wall. Uh, and the last example I want to give is something that we're actually investigating right now for kidney uh, transplantation. Um, and this is showing how we can actually re-engineer how um, an, immuno an immunosuppressant actually functions. So rapamycin is very common um, immunosuppressant. It's given at certain levels orally in order to inhibit T cell proliferation. Uh, so rapamycin is an mTOR inhibitor. So it can affect many different cells in many different ways. So it's limited by how much you can actually give because then you start to have side effects and off-target effects. So we decided what if we essentially just re-engineered rapamycin's function by not targeting T cells at all, completely avoid T cells, uh, but instead target different cell types. And so we started targeting these myeloid and APC populations like myeloid cells and, and, and dendritic cells um, while avoiding T cells. So no uptake by T cells, enhanced uptake by those other cell types delivering rapamycin. So the mTOR effect uh, is very specific for those cell types. It actually um, in, is a, results in a co-stimulation blockade. So it results in tolerogenic forms of these cell types, which actually was able to enhance upregulation of certain types of regulatory T cells. In our case, we had very nice upregulation of CD8 positive regulatory T cells which had a, a nice telogenic effect um, in our disease model. Uh, in this case, it was islet transplantation, but we're now shifting this towards kidney transplantation. But this is just the first example showing that we can tolerize with islets. So these islets were transplanted to the liver. We also did this in the kidney capsule model as well, but the liver model is considered more um, clinically relevant and also more difficult to maintain tolerance. So we did this with, with Xiaomin Zhang, um, the transplant center here at Northwestern. Uh, she's very talented. It was the only person I could find that could actually do these liver um, injections of islets. Um, and we found that it worked actually quite well. So this is with the kidney, 100% um, acceptance of these, of these kidneys after transplant of these um, um, islets transplanted to the kidney, um, completely tolerized. Um, they've been in these mice for up to three, over 300 days, which is about the limit because you start to get to the age range of, of, of mice. It reduced the toxicity of rapamycin, no side effects. Uh, we looked at this um, um, in terms of mRNA expression levels, the RNA seq to look at decreases in um, side effects of rapamycin. These particles do not have those side effects that, that we're seeing commonly with um, high levels of rapamycin uh, treatment. So I'm going to stop there, um, so make sure we have a few minutes for, for questions at the end. Um, but I was hoping I gave a, an overview of the systems that we work with, um, why we designed them this way, and why we think that they could be useful um, for, for kidney disease. And in particular, we can tap into all these different areas that have already been optimized for, for controlled delivery to make very rapid progress um, in terms of targeting in the kidney, in particular because um, we have this really nice core center here at Northwestern to the Go Kidney Center, which can integrate, of course, with material science and nanomaterial science that we have that's a strength here at Northwestern. Um, so I'll stop there um, and thank, of course, the students who did all of this work that I demonstrated today, as well as our funding sources. Um, and I'll be happy um, to take uh, any questions. Uh, thank you so much, Ivan, for this outstanding presentation. Um, huge potential for you know, kidney applications. And um, I'm going to start with a question in the Q&A from our division chief, uh, Dr. Quaggen, uh, who is asking, are there any examples of causing transient changes in a barrier to reach specific compartments, for example, in glomerulus, in the absence of diseases of the endothelium or barrier, 
could you actually provide a signal that transiently makes the barrier more permeable to allow nanoparticles to reach the other side? Uh, yes, you can do that. And that's, so a lot of people have done targeting uh, in terms of trans, um, um, targeting in the brain. Um, so the blood brain barrier can be modified in, in similar ways to enhance permeability. Um, this is also be, I'm not sure if this has been done in the case of kidney disease just yet, but it would definitely be possible. If you have a, a molecule uh, that could modify the endothelium in a certain way. Um, and actually one of our collaborators we're working with um, is modifying podocytes uh, just for, for this purpose. Um, and she has a, a molecule, I believe it's called K201, which is designed to modify podocytes, which can and, and modify the permeability um, at that interface. Um, and so, yes, we can definitely do that. Um, and that is a strategy that has been used in, in other disease uh, systems and these disease models. Um, excellent. And you know, from your presentation, something that I find uh, very exciting is really the ability for uh, precise targeting. And I guess that there are many ways um, to accomplish that, uh, but you um, um, mentioned the surface chemistry and apparently you can use peptides or antibodies. So um, in the kidney field, there is uh, similar to other fields. We see a lot of single cell RNA seq data. We better characterize different cell populations. So um, how do you compare these two approaches, antibodies versus peptides, uh, to be able to target specific cell populations um, in, in the setting of kidney disease? Oh, yeah. So that's a great question, because each one of your targeting strategies has advantages and disadvantages. And I believe peptide versus antibody is a really good example. Um, so with, with antibodies, you have a huge repertoire of things that are already out there. You can buy a commercially available antibody. We can modify it and conjugate it to the surface of the particle. And so that's great. Um, and that makes um, a really fast cell system that's customizable. But antibodies are large. Um, so we can only control so much the valency or the density of the targeting ligand on the surface. So we only get so much control. Um, additionally, um, one thing that's overlooked many times is the affinity can be too high. So for example, if you have an antibody specific for a certain receptor and that receptor is expressed at a high level by your target cell, but at a low level by another cell, if you have a high affinity antibody, it can target both almost equally because you have very high targeting, even if you have very low ex expression level. Um, with lower affinity ligands, like with antibodies, you can actually better customize that targeting because perhaps maybe you have to have multiple receptors bind. Maybe you have to have um, high valency targeting for it to actually to have a long enough interaction with the cell to induce endocytosis. So we find peptides to be more customizable because they're smaller, they're cheaper to make, um, and they can be conjugated to the surface in controllable densities to have that higher specificity between expression level um, on the cell. The bad side is that you have to have a peptide sequence that actually is going to bind your target of interest. And so many times you're limited to finding what's already been optimized in the literature. And so someone hasn't already done like a phage display library to figure out what peptide is going to bind to that receptor, you're kind of out of luck. Um, so that is, that's, that's the give and take uh, there. Excellent. Um, we have another question in the Q&A uh, from uh, Ivan Phillips. Very nice talk. What barriers to translation do you see for kidney targeted particles? Oh, so the main barrier to translation um, is, of course, uh, the fact that there aren't many nanoparticles available right now being applied to this. Um, so um, like I said, the, the current methods would apply to the kidney. So I think there could be rapid progress made. Um, but you're going to have you know, skepticism. You need to have demonstration of efficacy. And a lot of the, this just hasn't been done yet. Um, so I think the main barrier there is that we need more studies. Um, we need them done um, at higher order animal models. Uh, we need more animal models to, to mimic the types of um, disease states that we're trying to target. Um, so I think that's the biggest barrier is that it's, we're just limited by examples that have been successful. Excellent. Yeah, definitely more work is needed. Um, we have a question from Arnold Davis, um, who is asking, what are your next steps um, in your research with rapamycin delivery? Ah, uh, yes. So with rapamycin delivery, we're fairly excited. We want to get this paper out. Um, so we've 
Uh, we were asked to repeat almost all of our studies. So we've been doing that for the last year for this, for this uh, journal. And we're essentially complete now. So we're not gonna be trying this with, um, uh, we have preliminary data with kidney. So kidney transplantation. Uh, that's our main focus now in terms of um, the transplant space. Um, we're working with uh, Joe Leventhal uh, currently as well to try and get things going in this area. Um, but yes, applying these particles through different routes of administration, targeting different cell types uh, to better fine tune how we can get anti antigen specific tolerance. Um, so we are seeing that um, it is antigen specific, but it's still early stage. And we wanna see if we can better um, control the antigen specificity. Um, that would be the, the future there. Excellent, super. Uh, so I think that, uh, well, that uh, uh, takes care of the questions uh, posted um, up to this uh, point. Um, um, maybe there's opportunity to um, post questions, follow up following the compl completion of webinar. Uh, thank you so much for this um, um, outstanding presentation, Ivan. And um, I guess, uh, you know, we will uh, close here. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to present some of our work. And um, I look forward to, to working with everyone. So um, feel free to email me if you have any questions. Happy to help with anything. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for attending. You have a great day.